Hello everyone and welcome to my channel if this is your first time here and if not, welcome back. I want to start this video off by saying this is not the type of content I usually make. Um, I am a author writing centric YouTube channel. My channel has had many iterations over the years, starting with first um, being a channel talking about my transition, then switching to just kind of becoming more about marketing my content, and then moved on again to just, again, being talking about being an author and what that life is like and sharing resources, you know, helping indie authors is kind of my goal. Right now, it's been relatively dormant, but I'm trying to revive it. Really, I'm just, I want to get back to vlogging. I enjoy vlogging, even if I'm talking about nothing in particular. I like to uh, just make videos and, and share things with y'all. So I just realized I, I have my headphones on. That was not on purpose. The headphones are just to hear my playback. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's get to it then. Uh, enough dawdling. What is this video about? I want to say happy Pride Month. Um, today is a, an auspicious day for me. June 8th is the anniversary of when I came out publicly uh, in 2017. Um, I made this whole big fessy, messy Facebook <laughs> post about it, which apparently like ruined my parents' lives at the time. They have since actually thanked me for shaking things up so severely, so I guess that's fine. They still don't really believe that trans people are actually trans. On the whole, our relationship's actually pretty good. It's possibly the best it's ever been, which is really nice. Um, anyway, uh, by the time I came out publicly in 2017, I had been out to my close friends uh, for about three years. Uh, I initially came out as gender fluid, then I came out as transmasculine. This is a story I've told quite a few times on this channel. That's the spark notes. Um, if you want more detail, I'm sure you could just scroll through my history, uh, posting history, and find whatever it is you're looking for. Um, my journey since 2017, really since 2014, really since like the beginning of puberty uh, has been one of immense and painful growth and transformation physically, mentally, emotionally. The thing about transitioning, be it medically or socially, is that it requires a tremendous, tremendous amount of honesty with oneself. It requires a willingness to live, and it requires patience and plucky stick to and it demands both decisiveness and flexibility. I began my social transition in private in 2014, then in public in 2017. I began my medical transition in 2018 by starting hormone blockers, and then continued it in 2019 by starting testosterone, which I've been on for five years. Um, I had an emergency hysterectomy in 2020, uh, top surgery in 2021, and all of these actions have led me to the point where I am supremely comfortable in my body. I really want to highlight that my dysphoria was primarily physical, almost 0% social, meaning that once I passed to myself, it has no longer bothered me to be misgendered or, you know, identified as uh, AFAB or, or anything like that. It took a while to get here. I would not be at this point if I had not been able to transition medically and go to therapy. <laughs> like, those two things in conjunction are why I'm as comfortable in my skin as I am today. Uh, and so this is me, like, coming out again officially as non-binary. Uh, I made a post similar to this. And yes, I am uh, reading from the screen right now longer. because I just I want to talking make sure about that I'm saying everything transmasculine in an and still feminine way, in a way that accurately talking describes about how what I'm experiencing my transition I, has I just, helped. I don't want to miss a single aspect to of it. So I actually my spent feminine about two hours in my feminine side, writing out, you know, being socialized. Whereas I normally ad lib my videos. US society, this is me using a script. Pros and cons. If I keep looking down, that's what it is. Um, feeling a kinship with women and femme identifying people. And there's been this kind of like weird peace about all of it for me. It's just a really freeing and enjoyable state to be in. And I no longer have this anxiety built around, you know, am I going to pass? 
there's been this kind of interesting switch for me where I still get sometimes a euphoria when people identify me as he, him. And sometimes I still get a negative hit, like a dysphoria hit when somebody identifies me as like a she, her. But those two things are like becoming very close to a center line of new, like neutral, neutral vibes. Um, it would be interesting to see if, you know, five years down the line, both are euphoric, both are neutral or both are dysphoric. Because I am also having a situation where being identified as a man, which I don't think I ever wanted to be, nor will I ever be, um, is a dysphoria thing. And I think I really am looking at this from a perspective of, you know, once I had top surgery and once my voice dropped to where it's at, and once I just got comfortable in my skin, there was no longer this prevailing sense of anxiety and trying to avoid dysphoric situations and trying to avoid being in my body. And so I'm able to settle down and, and actually look at you know, who am I? Where am I? Where am I right now? As I said, this is me coming out this time as non-binary. Um, and I just want to say that, like, I'm happy with my transition. Like, I'm good, dude. Um, so I'm also coming out as deciding to stop testosterone. Um, Ten years ago, I thought I would have to be on T for the rest of my life. And ten years from now, I might decide that I want to go back. And, like, get back on tea. But for where I am right now, I'm happy. Like, I'm good. And I don't need any more changes in a masculine direction. I think I've hit all of my goals for being comfortable in my body. And if I were to go any further, I would probably start to become dysphoric. Um, so a lot of factors have led into this decision for me. The primary one being that I am satisfied with my transition and I don't wish to progress any further. I think I actually hit that point about a year ago where I was like, you know what, like this is good. And I had a period of time where because we were moving a lot uh, in the course of three months, four months, um, I didn't actually have access to testosterone. So I was actually off T for about three months and I was fine. I was actually more than fine. I saw some changes that I was really satisfied with. Um, and I realized that that's kind of where I want to be. But the second thing that has really led into this official decision and is possibly, not even possibly, it is equally as important as my overall general happiness and well-being um, is the emergence of some health stuff that I've been dealing with on a personal level. Um, as well as relating to my immediate family's medical history. Um, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. But I really want to focus on how big of a decision this is and how heavy it is. It carries a lot of weight for me as a trans person, for me as a person with medical-related trauma, um, for me as a person with like a shit ton of religious trauma. I have been carefully considering this decision over the course of the past 15 months and while coming off testosterone will likely have a few unwanted effects for me the pros greatly outweigh the cons my longevity will be more secure most of the changes i cherish will remain and my body's functionality will likely improve i will still have to be on hormone replacement therapy but this time i actually will be taking targeted estrogen as my body does not produce its own estrogen due to my lack of ovaries. I do not regret for a second having a total hysterectomy with bilateral oophorectomy. That was all, every single aspect of that surgery was medically necessary, not due to my transition, but due to pre-existing medical conditions that I was dealing with. So how, if, if having to go on estrogen is the thing that I have to do as a result of that, that is fine. I'm 100% comfortable with that trade-off. So no regret there. Um, but there is, you know, this strange sense of excitement and anxiety surrounding this choice. Um, 
being transgender in the United States and seeking a medical transition is difficult. Um, it's often a battle to like prove how trans you are in order to be taken seriously by doctors, and that really requires leaning very hard uh, and adamantly into the gender binary. I hope things are different now, but when I was trying to get on testosterone in 2019, actually this really started in 2018, trying to seek any kind of hormone therapy, it was a fight. It was really hard to get a doctor to take me seriously. How I mean, how many doctors have sat me down and explained to me, like I'm a toddler, the effects of testosterone on the body? And how many times have I been condescendingly cross-examined by medical practitioners so anchored into the Eurocentric gender binary construct that they consider my own gender nonconformity a mental illness or a mind control tactic by some trending social media personalities. It's, it is weird to step back from situations like that where I had to basically prove beyond a shadow of a doubt to these people that my transness fits into their idea of what being trans is, despite the fact that none of them were trans. I was the first trans patient for the majority of these people, and there wasn't as much conclusive literature out there for them to read about people like me, um, while also dealing with my own ingrained indoctrinated, religion-informed concept of gender. It was traumatic. And as a result, my testosterone was this like hard-won asset that I've just been clinging to with white knuckles because I fought so hard to get it and it can so easily be taken away. It's been like a constant companion, a friend, a tool that I fought for and used to like carve myself out of depression and like ideation and attempts, right? It's this life preserver that carried me from the sinking ship of trauma and dysphoria to the oasis of my body as I needed it to be, as I need it to be. And I'm here now, but letting go of it feels absolutely terrifying. I just, I really want that to sink in for people who maybe don't know what non-binary and trans people go through. Like, this is what a lot of us are feeling. And it's important to admit that. If you're a transgender or non-binary person watching this, it's okay to admit to yourself how hard you had to, f actually, it's important. It's not just okay. It is necessary to like identify for yourself exactly how hard you had to work for this thing and to analyze your relationship with it. How much of it is you holding on because you're afraid it's going to be taken away? And how much of it is you holding on to it because you genuinely want it? For the majority of people, who are holding on to it, it is because you genuinely want it, but I bet you there are like two of you watching this video who got here because you're considering going off T, but you're afraid of one, the effects that it might have on you physically, and two, the perception that other people are going to have of you. Or, you know, a third thing, which is just letting go of this thing that you've held on to for so long. It was useful for you then, is it still useful for you now? And that brings me to what I've realized, which is the battles that I fought for so long and hard, they weren't for testosterone. I didn't go to that doctor's office fighting to get hormones. I was fighting to transition into the body that is correct for me. And obviously, as we grow and change our ideas of what that is, grow and change, you know, deconstructing this, like, Eurocentric evangelical concept of gender, gender roles, sexuality, has led me to a point where, like, 
where I thought maybe I might need to go all the way to the other end of the spectrum and be this like big, hard, you know, stealth mask. I wanted to be stealth. That was never going to (laughs) happen. And now I'm at this point where like, this is the body that's correct for me. I'm good. So the testosterone that I had that I worked hard to get was just a tool that I used to slay that dysphoria dragon, if you will. Um, But now that that's gone, I'm standing in the middle of a battlefield with this sword that I'm clenched, clenching the hilt with these like white knuckles and I'm breathing and I'm panting and I'm covered in blood and there's nothing else to fight. At a certain point, that becomes harmful. And so for me, where I'm at right now, the dragon's gone, the dysphoria is a, you know, effectively non-existent, it's time to hang up my sword. And with the ultimate gratitude and respect for everything that that tool has done for me, move on with my life. So this June, I am choosing to celebrate every iteration of myself, every beautiful, wonderful, intelligent, strong, and yes, I'm going to say it, brave iteration of myself. The me's who had no means of coming out, the me's who were terrified to come out, the me's who set me down the path to where I am right now, they're all fighters who did everything they could to survive and to get me here. And the me now, and the me of the future, is ready to embrace this internal peace that all of that fighting did for me. I want to spend my energy on uplifting others. I want to help people, and I want to spend my time fostering gentleness and fierce love and joy. And that's where I am now. And that's where I want to be for as long as I can. So I will continue to keep you all appraised of how this progresses. Surprise, surprise, we're back to being a transition channel. Don't worry, it will not be the majority of my content for those of you who are just here for writing stuff. Um, The first step that I need to take is to talk to my endocrinologist, and I have an appointment set up for this. I do want to note that even though she's super kind and receptive, I am very nervous about it. Um, I still haven't found the right words to describe my gender, and maybe I never will. I think that's going to be the greatest hurdle uh, when it comes to speaking with any medical professionals in the future. Ultimately, though, I think as long as they understand that I'm prioritizing my health and my happiness, uh, I shouldn't have too many issues. So fingers crossed there. Um, My biggest concerns when it comes to going on estrogen are that I do not want to undo any of this progress, all right? I got these guys removed for a reason. Um, My chest and my voice were the two biggest contributors to my dysphoria. Um, So yeah, that's a big one. I also absolutely love my body hair. I'm just going to show off here for a minute. Look at look at that. Look at that. Look at that gorgeousness. It it is everywhere, if you were wondering. Everywhere. Um and I love it. My hairy chest and my hairy tummy and my hairy back and my hairy legs and my hairy booty and my hairy hobbit feet and my hairy arms are such a wonderful source of euphoria for me. You have no idea. That said, if I need to sacrifice my body hair for the sake of my longevity, and my overall health, I'm willing to make that concession. Thing number three, I absolutely love my curly hair. It started up around the one year mark of being on tea and its fluffiness makes me supremely happy. Um, I hope it doesn't go back to being less curly, but if it does, I will just permit. It makes me happy. (laughs) Um, Things I'm ready to leave behind by stopping tea are atrophy, Uh, that's a big one and it's not really treatable while still being on tea for me specifically i'm sure there are other options available to other people 
I've looked into it. I've talked to my doctor about it. Yeah. Um, also, so this is a tough one for me to talk about. It feels like bad luck to even say it out loud. Um, on my dad's side of the family, most of the men have cardiac issues by the time they hit like 40. Uh, my grandpa died in his 50s of his like 10th heart attack. He had consistent strokes and pulmonary issues. My dad has had heart surgery, I think, three times. My uncle ended up having like a quadruple bypass in his 50s. Like there's there's a lot going on there and I have had a really hard time keep being on tea and keeping my cholesterol and blood cell stuff managed. The flip side of that coin is while testosterone tends to make those things worse, estrogen actually tends to make those things better. And then of course, you know, strokes being a thing on my mom's side of the family. With my levels consistently staying where they're at, even with dietary changes, even with doing cardio and working out regularly, I was even on heart medication at one point. Um, it's no question. I don't want to keep increasing my risk of dying early or having to go through all of the cardiac stuff that the men on my dad's side of the family have had to go through. So that's that's a big one. Losing those risks by stopping tea? Yes, please. Um, also, struggles with maintaining a healthy weight. I'm, I'm happy to like lose that. Uh, according to my doctor, estrogen will help with weight management. I'm happy to lose moon face. I don't know if you guys have noticed. Um, there are times where my face is just like a, a full circle. Like, it's just circle and it's puffy. I've been on tea for five years. A lot of people by this point, it goes away. For me, it has not. Um, when I was off of testosterone for about three months last year, it went away. And I thought I looked great. So, um, I am also ready to drop any further masculinization, like beyond where I'm at right now. I'm good. Um, the final thing that I'm ready to leave behind is my receding hairline. Um, so for those of you who can tell, this actually goes back to my ear. My hairline has receded here and up here on both sides uh, about an inch, maybe qu three quarters of an inch. Uh, I'm not happy about it. I know that going on E will not likely make the hair grow back, but it will also not likely make it get worse. So we're, we're going to stick with that. Um, things that I'm hoping to gain by pursuing this path, um, obviously better blood health, better cardiac health, uh, my hairline to stay where it's at, uh, clearer skin, my acne has not been great of late, uh, healthier body weight, I am just barely overweight, uh, going on E will ideally bring me right into the ideal range. Um, this is again, despite dietary and like fitness stuff. Um, I'm looking forward to the booty and the hips for sure. Hey everyone, uh, it's Zahariel, or I guess you guys know me as Zach, uh, in editing and surprise, surprise, my camera cut out. Uh, while I was filming, so the mic still got everything, the camera did not. I'm going to go ahead and put a video of my cat being cute over this uh, next bit until my camera comes back. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, you guys can just enjoy watching my cat be adorable and listen to my voice like it's a podcast. We'll just, just pretend it's a podcast. Okay, thanks. Bye. Um, and uh, the waistline will be nice. Softening skin will be nice. I've been noticing, especially in my face, just how thick and coarse my skin has become. Um, and then just general longevity. Being on tea has its perks and it has its drawbacks. And your life, like the length of your life decreases <laughs> the longer you're on tea. Not by a lot, um, but not having... A uterus or ovaries also adds to that. So, so final bit here. 
Um, is this considered a detransition? No. I'm, I'm still trans. Uh, if I had been born in an XY body with typical XY presentation, I would still have probably found myself in this sort of non-binary middle ground. So, yeah, still trans. Like, not in a binary sort of way. Some people from the trans community seem to, like, be mad about people stopping their hormone therapy. I'm not really sure what that's about. Um, but also, I'm sure, like, the hard right... Uh, anti-trans people will want to use this as some kind of a case study for saying that people shouldn't be allowed to have access to hormone therapy or something. I just want to reiterate, like, I don't regret any of my transition stuff. I'm very happy with where I'm at. I wouldn't be here if I hadn't been able to transition medically. Like, I literally would not be here <laughs> in the most literal sense of the phrase. Transitioning looks different for everybody, and this is just what it looks like for me. Like, I consider this whole process as being like a race, uh, with the finish line initially seeming just impossible to reach, you know? Just completely unfathomable, even. Like, not even impossible to reach, but I didn't even know what a finishing line would look like for me in my transition. Uh, but, like, as you run and as you get closer to that finish line, you start to see it. It becomes more clear. Like, oh, I see it. It's over there on that, that hill that's very far away. And Or even it seems close, but you end up taking, like, some weird detours. You know what I mean? But then you get closer, you get closer, you see, you know, okay, hey, this is exactly what that looks like. And now I have finally crossed it. Like, it's not just like, oh, I can see it. Or, oh, it's so close I could almost touch it. I, it's back there. <laughs> like, I passed it already. You know what I mean? So there's there's no reason for me to keep running. Like, I've, I've completed my race, I've completed the testosterone journey, I've completed the, you know, the battle against the dysphoria dragon, for the most part. I think what I've, what I've been left with in terms of residual dysphoria is probably equivalent to what most non-trans, I'm gonna say, cis, I guess, people experience when it comes to just, like, social interactions uh at least in terms of like the western eurocentric binary concept like if you come across any woman who isn't like white and skinny and blonde and like rich she's probably going to have some feelings sometimes when people talk to her about how people talk to her like that's that's kind of where i'm at too i think um which is good. I think that's a good thing. Uh, and then also just like general, like, I think any non-binary person, a gender person living in a binary society probably feels weird and dysphoric sometimes about how that society talks to them. Like, that's kind of just where I'm at. But the physical dysphoria, we're good. Like, it's it's gone. Yeah, it's on to the next thing for me. And that's exactly what I intend to do. Just taking care of my health, pretty much. <laughs> that's that's where we're at. Um, so yeah, that kind of concludes my video. I plan to post updates as they happen, you know. I don't have a timeline for what that looks like yet. My appointment with my doctor isn't even until July, because that's kind of the soonest we were both available. Um, so yeah, if you're considering, you know, taking a similar path, or if you have taken a similar, similar path, feel free to share your story in the comments below. All I have to say about anybody leaving any comments is please, please, please just be kind, practice the golden rule. I have a block from channel button and I will not hesitate to use it. This is a safe space for people. This is a kind place, so please just be kind. If you would not say it to your child or you wouldn't want someone to say it to your child, don't say it to another person and don't say it to yourself. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap the video now. Um, thank you for watching. If you liked this video and you want to keep updated on my non-binary transition journey, consider subscribing. I also write and publish books, short stories, poems, anthologies, all the stuff. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video and you want to keep updated on my non-binary transition journey, consider subscribing. I also write and publish books, short stories, poems, anthologies, 
all the things, and I will begin posting videos related to that soon. I also plan to do live streaming on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays once I figure out a decent live streaming setup that doesn't crash my computer. Um, so expect that within the next month. Uh, I will be troubleshooting this weekend and hopefully it'll be back up and ready to go by the end of next week. All right, lastly, but even more importantly, and yes, I am once again reading from a script to make sure that I don't miss anything, please consider helping the people struggling in Gaza by checking out Operation Olive Branch. Operation Olive Branch is a grassroots effort to amplify Palestinian voices and crowdsource aid to those suffering from Israel's ongoing efforts to wipe out the Palestinian people. Operation Olive Branch also has efforts working to aid those suffering from the crises in both the Congo and Sudan, um, and you should see the link in the description on how to help with any of those. Um, that will be at the very top of my description, so feel free to check it out. Actually, don't just feel free, please do, like I am compelling you to check it out. Help those people, um, because people are suffering and it is not okay. And with that, uh, I bid you adieu.